Hello, everyone out there in podcast world. You're listening to the Service Business Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Tersh Blissett. This podcast is focused on service business owners, managers, and technicians who are considering becoming business owners themselves. My goal with this podcast is to ask the guests on this podcast questions that you may not have thought to ask to help arm you so that you become a better business owner, manager, or technician. I'm your host, Tersh Blissett. If at any time during this podcast episode you have a question or um, think about something that you'd like to, to ask me or for me to reach out to the guest to ask them, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is tersh at icebound.us. That's spelled T-E-R-S-H at icebound.us. Or reach out to me on any social media platform. It's at Tersh Blissett, T-E-R-S-H-B-L-I-S-S-E-T-T. It's pretty much the handle that I have everywhere. And don't hesitate to reach out to me. Today's guest is Adam Lean. He's the founder of the CFO Project. Adam became an accountant immediately after college, but quickly realized that accounting was not his calling. He left his nine to five world to launch an e-commerce company, but after a few years, Felt like something was off. Uh, Sales were up, the business was growing, but the numbers in the bank account just didn't tell the same story. Uh, Even as an accountant, Adam was frustrated by the financials, leaving him completely overwhelmed as a business owner. He set out to learn exactly what business owners should be focusing on, and eventually he founded the CFO Project. Today, he helps small business owners determine what is and isn't working in their businesses, creating a personalized roadmap to profitability and success without the emotional overwhelm. Today's episode, we're going to actually talk about uh, three reasons. There are a lot more than that, but three of the main reasons why uh, businesses fail and how we can avoid them as business owners. I'm super excited to share with you today's episode. And with that being said, welcome Adam to the show. Welcome to the show, Adam. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. So uh, for those who are listening and have never heard of you, tell us a little bit about your background and a little bit about um, what got you started into into what you're doing now. Okay. So I actually uh, graduated college uh, about 15 years ago and became an accountant. Uh, and absolutely hated it. (laughs) It was awful. Um, but, uh, I, you know, so I, you know, I moved to, uh, from my college town to Atlanta, became an accountant. I didn't know anybody. Uh, so I decided to start a business (laughs) at night on the weekend and and the, the small business bug just, just bit me. I mean, I, it's, Mm. it was, uh, I knew that's what I was meant to do. Um, so I started a business and uh, it was actually an e-commerce business. Uh, and that, oh, and it, interesting. Yeah. And that business uh, started in 2006 and it grew uh, within two years. I was doing half a million dollars in sales. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I was I was blown away. Um, and I still had my day job, but I was doing this. And then I, I was able to leave my day job and just focus on my business. Uh, and I took for granted the fact that I had this accounting knowledge because I, I ran my business a certain way. Uh, but then probably within the first three to four years, something was wrong. I felt something was wrong in my business. I was, sales were growing. I mean, they were, they were growing like gangbusters, but I was, my cash flow was not where it, uh, where it needed to be. My profit was definitely not where it needed to be. I started taking on debt. Uh, the problem was I just couldn't figure out what the problem was. I mean, that was, that, that was the problem. I didn't know what the problem was. And yet I had an accounting background. Something was wrong. I, I was wearing. Well, that makes me feel a whole lot better about myself. Then. I mean, yeah. I mean, I was wearing all these hats, uh, and still could you know I, I couldn't figure out what was going on with the business. Uh, I remember going. I, w- I was so frustrated. Uh, probably between year four and five of the business, uh, I remember going to a friend's house, just 
just down and out. And he asked me what was going on. And I just, I remember putting my heads, my head in my hands and just, just saying, I need help. <laughs> so how did you, how did you, I don't mean to interrupt you because this is very interesting, but how did you um, know that something was wrong? Because us as business owners, and, and this isn't even the topic of the of the show or anything like that. Uh, it's just one of those things that I know that everybody is listening is has probably felt the exact same way that you feel or you felt back then. But how did you how did you know that that was there? Like I, I've had that feeling before, where it's like, okay, we did three quarters of a million dollars last year. Um, and I'm pretty sure, you know, we had, you know, I know the margins were there, but I still felt like something wasn't right. And that's when I started firing a lot of my customers. But like, how did you, how did you know, like that there was something wrong? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for a couple, there's a couple ways that I knew, uh, first I just wasn't happy. I mean, I got into business. I got. I started a business because I wanted to, and I I had that that entrepreneurial small business owner bug, you know that. that and, and so <laughs> I knew this is what I was meant to be. But I just my my I just wasn't happy. But that that was number one, and and I knew something was wrong because of that. Uh, it was it was the reason why I got into the business. It, that that passion wasn't there anymore. Something was wrong. The second was even though sales were growing, and this is because this this was because I had an accounting background. Sales were growing, but sales is not the most important thing in a business. I mean, the entire point of a business is to make a profit, uh, which turns into cash that the owner gets to keep. Now, now the owner can do whatever they want with the cash. They can give it all away. They can reinvest it in their business. They can, you know save it or invest it, it, it the, but the the point is the entire point of a business is to to manufacture cash for the owner and my cash flow was was dwindling my you know the margins were were getting tighter and tighter um which which means i had less you know less profit margin which translated into less cash which means i had to take on debt um and so I, it just something was wrong yeah yeah, that's never fun. Whenever you're, um, especially in, uh, I feel like there are certain industries where your revenue number is like a vanity mm -hmm. number, and and you're telling people, you know, I'm doing three million dollars a year, but then you have, you know, you've paid yourself a um, a fair a fair wage or whatever the the IRS states that it has to be, and but then at the end of the year you have you know ten thousand dollars and you know, net profit and you've done $3 million in sales. Right. So you could have really have done $750,000 in sales and had more net profit if you, you know, structured totally. it right. Or you could have just gotten a job and saved yourself the headache. <laughs> <laughs> the stress, right. the seven years of record keeping. Yeah, <laughs> right. definitely. But, but I feel there's a reason why, you know, we don't, you know, we collectively business owners don't go and get a job because we enjoy the fact that we have a business and we have the autonomy mm -hmm. and the flexibility, but that still doesn't negate the fact that we've still got to stay in business. <laughs> From the e-commerce business, did you, did you stay, stick with it? Did, how did, where did it go? I, I Yes, I stuck with it for a while. Um, I did whatever I could to turn things around, and I did uh, for the most part. Uh, but I think that so I ended up selling that business uh, a few years later uh, to one of my largest suppliers, um, and I started consulting with other businesses. And I think when when I was at my lowest with the business, and I I just needed you know that day I was at my friend's house, I just. I just needed help. The I think mm -hmm. the 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 biggest problem was that I had nobody to turn to. Uh, I tried and I and I tried asking everybody I knew. I I talked to my bookkeeper and my accountant, and they tried to give me this help, but that's not what they're getting paid to do. They're getting paid to record the books properly and to make sure taxes are done properly. Uh, but they're not they're not paid to to be strategic thinkers in the business. Um, and then I, of course I tried talking to friends and family and all that they wanted to help. They just weren't, you know, they just, it was really no help. <laughs> they wanted to be supportive, but not really give you advice. Absolutely. That's yeah. right. <laughs> or the, the advice that, yeah, <laughs> or the advice they gave was just awful. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yep, um, 
Yeah. So, so anyways, I started consulting with other businesses and I realized that I took my accounting background for, for granted. Um, uh, and I, what ended up helping me in my business was the fact that I took this sort of methodical approach and worked backwards though. The, the entire point of a business is to generate cash. Well, okay. If you do it if, to do that, you need to generate profit. And then there's a series of things you need to do to do to generate profit. And so I had this sort of structure, this system, and the clients that I were working with loved it. They liked having this, this sort of plan. Um, and so that turned into a financial coaching businesses for small business owners, which is what a CFO, a chief financial officer does for big businesses. They simply coach the leadership on, hey, these are the four things that need to happen this month to make sure that you're on the right track financially. That's what CFOs do for big businesses. And I thought, hey, you know, that's what I would have loved to have when I was struggling. And that's what business owners need and crave. They just need some a guide, a financial guide to help them make their business strong. And so that's that's kind of where I where I am today. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah. yeah. And so most people in, in small businesses, I feel like most people feel like or have the impression that a CFO is kind of out of their price range until you get to, you know, multi million dollars at least uh, before you start having a, a true CFO on board. Um, so I really like what you have going on with the CFO project and you're doing what we perceive as an untouchable thing for the next couple of years, but you're able to do that for the small businesses. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. The m most businesses that are doing less than I'd say 5 million in sales don't need a CFO. They hardly even need a controller type person. They definitely need a bookkeeper. Uh, but, but that doesn't, negate the fact that every business needs some sort of help. Right. And that's and where so we come a, in. Yeah. A lot of times it's a service tech that just got out of a van and, and got into an office and doesn't have a clue about bookkeeping or anything like that. And, and I'm guilty of being that person, uh, especially, you know, sometimes whenever I'm trying to be cheap, uh, but it's, it's something that we must have. It's, it's a must have if you want to stay in business and if you want to grow your business for sure. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the three reasons that businesses fail and not just the reasons they fail, but how to avoid those reasons. Yeah, definitely. And and actually you just hit the nail on the head on the first reason. Oh, sweet. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's a, a lack of business acumen is, is reason number one. Uh, most businesses that are started in the United States are service-based businesses. And they're precise. The reason why is precisely for what you just said. So, and somebody has an expertise in their craft. So like a, you know, a heating and air person, somebody that, that's an expert at heating and air starts a service-based business selling heating and air. Uh, and so all of a sudden they have this business that requires them to do a whole lot more things than just heating and air. Uh, but they don't have any, they, they don't have the, uh, the, the expertise or the knowledge or the acumen to do that. Um, and so they end up running their business like a job instead of a business. Absolutely. Agree. Agree. They stuck, they're stuck in that transit, that transition from that technician to, if anybody's listened to or read the E-Myth Revisited by yep. Michael Gerber, you know, they're stuck in that, that technician role for sure. And I, I have seen myself do that. And then when I started Icebound, uh, it was a weird, and I get this question all the time. So if you're thinking this question as I speak it, you know, it's a normal question and feel free to reach out to me and I'll tell you how I did it. But, uh, <laughs> I, I refused to be a technician when I started Icebound. Uh, we literally had two people in the office and one service technician because, uh, I, I wanted to make sure that I did not fall back into the technician role, uh, hmm. as much as possible. Really interesting. Yep. How did you, so how did, how did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, very, very, very carefully and very deliberately as well. Uh, the technicians, and they still do this today, like as, as I get more technicians, uh, they know that I am quote unquote an expert in our, our field. I have 15 years or well more now uh, experience in our industry. And so it's very easy for them to call me for tech support or they want me to come to a job site. And if I'm truly bored, if I'm caught up for the most part, I'm never always caught up all the way caught up. But if I'm 
to the point to where I can leave the office, I will go out on the job site just to, you know, stretch my legs and get back in that field for a day or so. But for the most part, uh, I refer them to tech support and I've always done that. And I really am push, I push them to do that even more with Icebound. Uh, and then if they do call me with a problem, this is something that I've shared with a lot of people. I go to, I've gone to a couple of uh, trade expos and stuff like that. And people will ask me how I've done it. And the biggest thing is, is if one of my people call me with an issue, they must also call me with three solutions mm. as well. Oh, that's awesome. So if they, if they have come up with three solutions, then they've put forth the effort and they've probably figured it out on their own. And if they haven't figured it out on their own, then they really are stumped and they need my help. Wow. Well, that's great. I mean, that, that's amazing. I, most, most business owners are, are, don't have that philosophy, <laughs> especially service-based. Yeah, no, no. I, I saw that whenever, before, whenever I first started the podcast, um, that was a lot of people were talking to me about how to get out of the field as a, as a technician. And that was one of the ways that I came up with you know, off the cuff. And then, so when I started Icebound, um, I really wanted to make sure that I wasn't a technician so that I could, you know, kind of preach, yeah, walk, work, preach, work on you know. the business instead of in it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so the, the first reason is that businesses fail is just because the owner lacks that business acumen. Uh, the, the business owner, uh, you know, gets into business because they're experts, they're an expert at their craft. Um, and they tend to do things on a daily basis that revolve around their craft, which means they're spending a lot of times doing things that may not contribute to what's most important. And again, what's most important is generating cash flow. Um, so they can focus on sales, like we talked about earlier, and that may not be the reason, the, the thing that they need to focus on this month. Uh, or this quarter, they may need to focus on their their margin, their, uh, their reducing their job cost or or uh, expenses or the labor cost. Uh, there's uh, so the, that's a yeah. really good point. I, I really like that because uh, as business owners in general, even myself, you know, knowing kind of what what roles I need to be doing, I I've, tend to put out fires. And I try to be conscious of not being that person that just puts out fires all day and then get right. home exhausted and you have nothing to show for the day other than the fires that you put out. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm, I'm guilty of it myself of just, you know, going around putting out fires and not concentrating on what you really have to do to grow the business. Absolutely. I have a uh, client that, uh, that's been in, he bought his business 15 years ago. And before that he was the vice president of sales for a huge fortune 500 company. And he thought, well, Hey, I'm mm -hmm. great at sales. Let me buy a business. So he re <laughs> retired from that, bought a business. And he came to me a year and a half ago because he says, I've, I've now uh, 13 years into my business and I have nothing to show for it. And mm. the, the, it's a sad reality because a lot of business owners sort of feel that way. They have nothing saved up and it's, they're just sort of spinning their wheels. They're, they're making a dollar and spending 99 cents. Uh, and the reason was in this particular case, and I think this applies to a lot of business owners is, is that the, you know, my client, the, the, the former vice president of sales was great at one thing. He was great at the sales and he was great at, uh, at the, the, the knowing how to speak to the customers and, and generate sales, but in his former job, he had all these other people to handle marketing and operations and accounting and, and, uh, logistics. And, and now all of a sudden he didn't have to just focus on sales in his business. He had to focus on everything and he just simply was not good at it. Yeah. So those leads aren't coming in and I've seen salespeople from, some companies are like a larger company and then come into like I hired a guy one time uh, last year and he was really good at sales, but all the sales that he was really good at were the slam dunk leads that were coming in the door, you know, from service techs as hot leads. And so he was, you know, basically just going there right. and getting paperwork and then fruit. you come, come to a company, right. You come to a company that's a, you know, basically a startup. It's a Absolutely. whole different ball game. So. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I have, an, I have another client that's a doctor. I mean, he, he told me, he says, I'm great at being a doctor. I'm not great at being a business owner. <laughs> that's right. Um, and he, but, but see, that's the thing. Also, he needs to f focus on what he does best. 
he doesn't need to divert most of his time to to figuring out how to improve uh you know profit and cash flow he needs to focus on his craft and get better at that because that's why people come to him uh but but that still means that he needs somebody on his team to 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 sort of show him the 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 two to three things he has to focus on that way he could cut out the noise and just eliminate the confusion and just focus on these two to two to four things yeah no i agree 100 percent. and i've talked in past episodes too about as soon as you figure out something that you don't like doing or something that you're not good at doing you know um have somebody do that you know sub that out yeah. you know give some give delegate that that responsibility off to someone else because there's somebody else out there in the world that actually enjoys doing what you despise doing. <laughs> right. And they'll probably, they'll probably do it for not as much money as you could be making by not doing it. Absolutely. A hundred percent agree. And so I, I think, you know, the, the first reason of, of reason of why businesses fail is because of the owner lacks this business acumen. So really the owner can do, you know, one of two things. They could do exactly what you just said and just find somebody either on your team or just somebody else that can, uh, come alongside them and, and help them be this financial guide, um, which is essentially what, you know, what we do, we're, we're financial coaches, um, and, or they can just do whatever they can in their, in their downtime to just get better at business and hone their, their financial acumen. I mean, really anybody listening to this podcast is already a step ahead of most business owners. They're, they're listening to a podcast <laughs> that's actually you know, that's helping them be a better business owner. I mean, so that's, that's great, but there's tons of business books. The E-Myth book you, you mentioned earlier is a fantastic book. Um, and there's tons of others, but just get better at being a, you know, at honing your business acumen and not just your craft. Sweet. So how about, uh, number two? So number two is lack of, uh, profit. And so this sounds obvious, Business has to have profit to uh, to stay in business, uh, but it, it even though it sounds easy enough, you just simply spend less than you bring in. It's 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 really uh, it's tricky, difficult. Tricky. There's there's so many moving pieces. Exactly, um, and I found that there's there's really three main drivers of why a business is lacking profitability. Um, first is not enough sales. So either there's little or no demand for what they're offering. Um, or they just haven't found a cost-effective or sustainable method to generate sales. Um, so, so not enough sales. The second cause of a lack of profitability is not enough margin in their oh yeah in their service. Yeah. I see that a lot, where uh, especially a newer company, like really fresh companies that are starting out, that uh, they seen what their boss was charging in their previous job. And they didn't, they didn't understand their overhead expenses and whatnot. So uh, they didn't know what margins they needed to be charging on top of their, the, the part. So they they'd see a, a cheap part that maybe cost them $10 and they're charging $125 for it. And they didn't understand why their, their previous employer was charging that amount. So then they would just charge $50 for it. And then in their mind, they just made $40 an hour profit or whatever the case may be. And they didn't understand that, you know, all of their overhead expenses, you know, they have to be added into those expenses as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're right. There's, there's no point in making a hundred dollars if, if you have to spend $99 to get it. hundred percent agree. Um, yeah. And so the, and the third cause of lack of profitability is just too much overhead. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm the type of person just being a financial person Anytime a business owner spends money in their business on anything, they have to question whether or not they're going to get a positive return on investment from it, whether it be rent, payroll, uh, you know, marketing, you know, anything that you spend in your business, you have to make sure that you're getting a return or else you might as well keep the money in your bank account. Like why spend the money? How, it's not going to help. So on that, how would you determine if um let me see the best way to word this a like a quote unquote branding um so that's i mean obviously that's you know it falls under marketing but you don't see an immediate roi on it and then also 
your employee engagement experience. I kind of see that that uh, argument brought to the table sometimes too. Like it's not a measurable ROI, but um, having that experience, uh, it could improve the amount of time that you that an employee spends with you. I, I guess that's kind of the things that I think about whenever I'm. And then like a new van versus a a used van, like how do you have that conversation in your mind of, okay, this van's $26,000 and then a different van maybe would only cost me $15,000, but it has 40 or 50,000 miles on it. And like, as a CFO, how do you justify one versus the other? Yeah, no, those are all great questions. And for each of those scenarios that you mentioned, we would just, we would essentially create forecasts and say, all right, if we do a, this is what we anticipate the profit to be. And if we do B, this is what we anticipate the profit to be. And then we'll just compare. Uh, and we'll try it for every one of those things. We'll just try to get uh, the most concrete, accurate data or numbers as much as possible so that we could come up with a good, uh, good guess on what the ROI would be. Okay. So have you had the conversation with anybody in the past about um, like taking their employees, like they have a handful of guys and taking them on a fishing trip or, uh, spending that money on like a carnival type setup for like a family atmosphere, because I, I don't see profit in those numbers at all. Uh, so you're talking about with, uh, employee engagement, keeping them, yeah, keeping yeah, yeah. employee. So what's the goal? What would be the goal? Is it retention? A retention and then an atmosphere where they would potentially share it with other people and, you know, possibly get more employees to come on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like we're measuring. So we would come up with what we're measuring. That way we know whether it exceeded our expectations or not. And it sounds okay. like we're measuring two things, employee retention and then mm -hmm. uh, employee uh, satisfaction, I guess, which would turn into them trying to find other qualified people to come work with you. Right. Um, yeah, that sounds about right. And so we would, we would essentially measure that. What does it look like to have a employee, you know, retention? What, what would be, uh, the, the number that you would be satisfied with if, if you had a, you know, a 75% employee retention, is that okay? Uh, and then that would be our, what we're measuring. Um, I call it, you know, it's, uh, we call it a key result. That's what we're measuring. Um, and then there's just a series of things that we would do to, to figure out how we would actually accomplish that. Okay. Simple enough. Simple enough. Yeah. But it, 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 in, in other words, it all just boils down to, we've got to be really clear on what we're focusing on, uh, this particular month. And if employee retention is the number one thing that would help Im improve the cash flow and profit the most, then, then we'll assign that employee retention as the, the, the thing we're focusing on this month. And then we'll just deep dive into what that looks like and whether or not, whether or not we, you know, what we're doing is working. Um, yeah. Cause everything goes back to, will this be the most important thing for you to work on this month of all the things you could be working on? <laughs> is this the most important thing to improve your profit and cash flow? <laughs> I, I laugh at that because, <laughs> Because it's like next shiny, shiny object syndrome. <laughs> oh my goodness. And I, I think that's because we're all business. We're, we're, we like all of us, including myself are that way because we're, I mean, that's like, that's why we're business owners, yeah. <laughs> but we've got, we, we've still got to stay focused because, you know, just like my client that's been in his business for 13 years and has nothing to show for it. It's precisely because he didn't look at things from an objective standpoint to say, all right, what is, what are the, the very few things I need to work on right now to move the ball the most? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, 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 okay. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I mean, it's, it's the, the biggest, dr most dramatic efforts or the, the least amount of effort for the biggest results at the same time of, you know, most important things to get moved from point A to point B right now. Absolutely. We, we use a, a methodology in our business, uh, when I'm, you know, when we're coaching, when we're doing the financial coaching with our, uh, uh, small business owner clients, 
uh, one of the things that we use is the same tactic that that several large companies like Google and Amazon uses, and it's called objectives and key results. I mentioned key results earlier, mm -hmm. uh, but Google has used this from this concept from day one uh, in, in 1999 when they started the, uh, uh, they were introduced to this concept. But the whole idea is for you to stay focused on the most important objectives this month. And then the key results is how do we measure the objective? How do we know we've, we've accomplished it? Um, and that way they're stripping that we're stripping down of all the things that need to be worked on into just, just the most important three to five things every single month. And that's what we walk our clients through. We help identify what those objectives need to be because we're the ones analyzing the financials and saying, Hey, you need to work on X, Y, and Z this month. And then we'll help let's, let's strategize on how to do that. So what happens if you find that um, their sales is the number that, that needs to be changed and they, they have leads coming in, but they're not capitalizing on them? Are you offering advice on how to get them to close more sales or are you just saying, hey, look, you need to you know, work on this to get you know, your, these numbers are the ones that are hurting? Yeah, so it's a combination. That's a good question. It's a combination of the two. The, first, the, the most value that we provide is we, we dive deep into their financial performance every single month. And we have a specific methodology to do this. Uh, where we'll identify that it's not just sales. We'll identify the specific categories of sales that need working on, that need, that need fixing. And then we'll, we'll, we'll determine whether it is a sales problem or is it a leads problem or is it a gross profit problem. Um, and we'll, we'll pinpoint, we'll get on the call. We have a strategy call once a month with the client and we'll say, Hey, you know, Mr. Client, here's the, here's the four things we've identified, the specific four things that we've identified that need fixing this month. So let's brainstorm on this call on how to make that happen. And then we'll start with the very first one and we'll spend, uh, you know, about 10 minutes on it, brainstorming how to make it happen, how to include members of their team. Um, and. And, and once we do that for all four, then we'll check in every single week to make sure there's progress because we want to make sure we're accomplishing those things. That way the business owner can focus on, you know, what they do best, knowing that there's some, there's a plan happening to make sure that they're on track financially. That makes sense. So ha have you ever experienced a, I'll give you a scenario. Um, so we have residential replacements where we'll average, you know, it ranges. It's right now our, our average ticket prices up there is, you know, more than what it was last year. It's like $9,400 okay. for a system replacement. And those numbers right now are good. This month they're good. Last month they were bad. Um, and then our service numbers, they're kind of mediocre because we have some training involved and it's, we're coming right out of our slow season. Mm -hmm. Is there ever a time where you're, where you're like, okay, you need to focus on getting more of those residential replacements because they're, the margins are better there than improving your service and then improve your service after you get more margin or more of your, uh, residential replacement. Yeah. Great, great question. Yes, absolutely. And the, the, that's actually one of the first things that we'll do when we start working with a client, we'll, we'll mm. understand, we'll, we'll literally, uh, identify all the different revenue categories in their business. Uh, so for example, in this case, in this case, you know, just to keep things simple, you have replacement units and service costs, and then we'll identify the, we'll, we'll measure the performance of each of those revenue categories for the past 12 months, at least. Uh, and then we'll measure them on a monthly basis ongoing, not just sales, but also the, the, uh, the cost of sales so that we know how much of each of these revenue categories are, are attributing to the bottom line, your profit. Cause again, that's what we're focused on. And so you're absolutely right. We'll, we'll say, you know, this particular revenue category is the most important to work on because that generates, uh, more to your bottom line, or we'll say, Hey, I think you need to work on this other revenue category. As long as you can reduce the you know, the service cost by mm -hmm. X amount. And we'll just brainstorm what that looks so, like. 
You mentioned going back 12 months. Is there ever a situation where you're working with a company that is less than 12 months old? Yes. Uh, <laughs> most, <laughs> most clients have been in business at, you know, most of our clients have been in business at least a year. Uh, but there definitely is, uh, you know, that, uh, and we'll just use whatever data that they have. And that's the, uh, that's the other, okay. that's another tip I would, I would say to, to every business owner, make sure that your data, your, your bookkeeping is accurate. I mean, it's crazy the amount of business owners I come across where their bookkeeping is just a mess. How, I mean, how can you play the game without knowing the score? <laughs> <laughs> It's so yeah. funny because it's like, it's, it's, it's a uh, checkbook, uh, right. checking account, <laughs> bookkeeping. Right. Oh, there's, there's money <laughs> there's in the bank. Let's there. spend it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but how do you know, how do you yes. know what to, to do strategically? How do you make managerial decisions if you don't know the score? And, <laughs> You're putting out fires and right. there's money in the checking account. We're good. We're in business still. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. No, I, I totally get it. And I've been guilty of that in the past myself. So, I mean, I, I've felt that pain. And then, you know, it's always the saying is trash in, trash out. So oh my goodness, the, da yes. the data that you keep is only as good as the data you put in, you know, and absolutely, uh, I've recently swapped over to a new bookkeeper. And in that process, there were things that the old bookkeeper would keep one way and then the new bookkeeper keep it a different way. And so that transition was like, Oh my gosh, like trying to figure out the, you know, the best way of, <laughs> of uh, like, Oh my gosh, it's just, it's beyond stressful sometimes, but yeah. Anyways. So how about number three? All right. So third reason. yeah. So the first one was lack of uh, business acumen for why business owners mm -hmm. fail. Second is lack of profit. And the third is lack of cash flow. So mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's really three and there is only three ways to get cash for your business, any business. The first is to get a loan from the bank. Um, of course, that's difficult and they want it back. <laughs> they want the money back. Uh, second way is to get investors. Uh, most small business owners, especially service-based businesses, don't need investors. It's, it's not really practical. Uh, plus, you have to give away a piece of your business. Um, I mean, it shows like Shark Tank glorify uh, getting investors, but it, for, for most business owners, it's really not practical. Um, the third way to get cash is, is of course, to make a profit, um, which we've just talked about. It's the, the best way to, uh, to generate. I'm a big fan of not taking on debt as if, if you can help it. Um, because, you know, of course you have to pay that money back. Um, especially if you're taking on debt to pay, uh, just operating expenses. Uh, it's one thing to take on debt to 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 take on a big initiative that will help generate you know revenue or buy an asset, um, but just to fund day to day expenses is really not the best way. So so well, one of the things which is why we focus on profitability. I mean, it, we want mm -hmm. you to increase your cash flow through profitability uh, to self fund your business. Um, I mean, it, it, the stress, it's unbelievable, it's unbelievable the, the, the stress on a business owner and they, when there's a, there's so much debt and not enough cash flow coming in. And when we start relieving that, I mean, they have a, they have a new sense of, of peace. So having a peace of mind, knowing there's a plan in pay, place to, to make sure that their businesses will not only, you know, survive, but actually thrive. <laughs> So do you ever have any businesses that have really, that are really seasonal and they get a, um, a line of credit that they would use during the slow season and then pay it back at the, the busy season or, yeah, and do they do that strategically? Because like our slow season is right around the end of the mm -hmm. year. And so if you carry the profit, so if you muscle through one slow season and then you take the profit from the next busy season and you use that during your slow season, then at the very end of the year, you're going to end the year with a lot of profit. Right. And at, yeah, you hit the, you hit the nail on the head. It's it, the, the ultimate goal is to self fund your business so that you don't have to get that line of credit during the slow season. 
So banking, you know, planning ahead, which, you know, is super important, planning ahead to, to make sure that we earmark some of this cash to get us through the, 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 the non, uh, the slow season. Uh, the second mm-hmm. point though, is that business is that, uh, is that during the slow season, it's, it's highly important to, to get as lean as possible in your operations <laughs> So that you're not, you, you don't have these huge carrying costs. Um, and, and that's one of the benefits of being your own, you know, your, your own boss is that you don't have all this red tape to go through. You can make the decision to operate mm-hmm. as lean as possible. Uh, I mean, and, and that goes back to my point earlier, every expense, every time you write a check or, or swipe that credit card or debit card, you have to ask yourself, is this helping me in, in you know, is this going to help me in my effort to improve my profit? Is this going to give me a positive return, uh, return on investment? Um, and if the answer is no, then why spend the money? Um, and if you constantly do that, then you will be a, a very lean business so that you can get through those down seasons without, or those down months without having to, having to take out a line of credit. Do you ever see somebody that hinders themselves hinders their growth whenever they're asking that question constantly. Um, like I've picture in my mind, someone who's saying, uh, you know, I don't really need this marketing to make a profit. I can make a profit without Mm -hmm. this marketing, but if they had spent the money on the marketing, they would be growing more. So, yeah, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. I would say about half of, of my clients are, you know, they, they just, they, they want to grow as fast as possible. And so they, they won't blink twice and they'll spend the money. Um, the other half are super conservative. Uh, but it, but it all goes back to, uh, what, you know, one of the, actually when, when I take on a new client, one of the first things we'll do is we'll establish a three-year goals for the business to sort of, understand and put on paper, where does the client want their business to go? And so almost all the decisions that we make, the financial decisions will be pointed towards, will this help us get to where you want to go in the business? So it may be that spending the marketing money is the wisest thing to do, but at least we're doing it with, we're we're doing it uh, using logic and, and reason. Yeah. Not just the, at the moment, you know, that feels right to do it. So we're going to do it. Just throw this money away basically. Right. And, and if we do it with logic and reason, we're going to measure the results Mm -hmm. and, and and compare it with, you know, we're, we're going to measure it. Typically the business owners that just spend money just because, you know, just, just to grow, they don't really, they, they tend not to, to look at the results of that money. Yeah. Did it, did it actually produce a return? Did it, you know, did it help? That makes sense. Totally. So one of the things you mentioned earlier was, um, service business is not really, really needing investors. Have you ever experienced a service business that was attempting to scale pretty heavily and they took on investors and it was a good decision? Uh, <laughs> there's a, there's, there's a couple of, of businesses that we've worked with that they've, they've gotten investors in the form of partners. Okay. like active partners in the business. Uh, and it's usually two people that have an expertise in the subject. So they're really not, you know, so for example, if a roofing company, mm-hmm. you know, two, uh, you know, uh, somebody that owns a roofing company says to their friend who also uh, understands roofing, Hey, why don't we partner together and we can grow this thing really big. Uh, that, it's usually not, it usually doesn't end that well <laughs> for a couple of reasons. One, they're both experts at the same thing. I mean, what, so, you know, you, if you're going to bring on an investor, you should at least bring on somebody that's an expertise in something you're, you're not. Right. Um, and then the second is they usually end up, uh, butting, butting heads <laughs> because one is either doing more work than the other, or they're, they're, uh, you know, or they just don't have the same philosophy. You know, Dave Ramsey, uh, he says that the only ship that doesn't sail is a partnership. <laughs> and I, I, I totally believe that. <laughs> yeah. I think the only way that I've ever seen uh, partnerships work 
is a very well laid out partnership agreement prior to starting, you know, together with each other. And even then you have to revisit it to make sure you're following that agreement or it doesn't Absolutely. need to change or something to that effect. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. But if you're going to bring on an investor, it needs to be somebody that investor needs to bring something to the table other than just their, the, the same expertise that you have. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if they're a marketing, if, if, if they're a sales and marketing person, I actually had this happen with a client. Uh, they, it's an IT services client. Uh, and the two guys that owned it knew IT, but they were not salespeople. So they hired a salesperson that didn't really know IT. Um, and that, that worked okay because they, this, the, the salesperson had a clearly defined role. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it sort of separated their duties, but when two partners come together and they kind of both do the same thing, I mean, you can't really have a, you know, you can't really have a business with two heads. Yeah. Yeah. That makes things very, very difficult. Right. Even, even with clearly defined rules, if, if you know how they're supposed to be doing something, you could be, uh, subliminally, you know, thinking that they're doing something wrong because you, you're an expert in that field also. Right. Yeah. You know? I, I get that totally. Do you ever have anyone that that t that only invests financially, like a, a financial investor, with no uh, partnership or anything like that, other than owning a percentage of the company? I haven't really happened. I haven't really experienced that with my clients because I I typically uh, work with clients that are doing between two hundred fifty thousand and and two and a half million in sales. Gotcha. Uh, but it. It's, it doesn't mean that it couldn't happen. Uh, but again, with service-based businesses, you're the, the, the proprietary thing, the proprietary asset that the business has is usually the knowledge of the business owner. That's what, that's kind of what they're selling. So it's hard to invest in that. Uh, but if the business, you know, if the business has, has created this unique, um, process or this machine, or they have uh, a very unique client uh, and large client database, then it's not unheard of for somebody to, to want to invest in that. Gotcha. Cool. That's the only questions that I have. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to add? I mean, it just, the, the, if, if listeners don't take anything else from this conversation, but this is to protect your cash as much as possible. It needs to be like a child. <laughs> <laughs> Protect your cash flow as much as possible so that you don't have to go out and get investors or go into debt. You can self-fund your business. I and mean, what you do with that cash is up to up to you. I mean, you know, but but you need cash to stay in business. And the best way to do that is to make a profit. But you've got to have a plan. You got to do it on purpose. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't happen by accident. Absolutely. <laughs> cool. Thank you for coming on the show. If somebody wants to reach out to you and get in touch with you, what's the best way for that, that to happen? Uh, great question. So the CFO project.com is my website. So the CFO project.com. Uh, but if you go to forward slash SBM, so the, the CFO project.com slash SBM, um, I've actually have a, uh, the, the three reasons why businesses fail and I have some tips there. Um, anybody can go and get that and just go through it on their own time and, and sort of brainstorm how they can avoid those three reasons in their business. Cool. Um, and if anybody wants to get on a phone call with me, I have my, a link to my calendar. Just feel free to jump on my calendar. We'll get on a call. I'd love to meet you. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all your information and knowledge with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Oh, yes, yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Service Business Mastery Podcast. The podcast focused on service business owners, managers, and technicians who are considering becoming business owners themselves. Like I said at the beginning of the, this episode, if you want to reach out to me, feel free to reach out to me, tersh at icebound.us. That's my, uh, my business email address. Um, it's, I've found that it's probably easier to, to send me messages there. Uh, I check that uh, pretty often. You'll actually get an autoresponder letting you know that I only check it twice a day. Uh, it's one of those things that I'm trying to 
automate my life and and structure things so I'm not sitting in front of the computer every time it dings I'm checking emails I'm trying to try my my hardest to force myself into that routine uh, and then also uh, my clients I, I want to train them so that they're not expecting a, a response instantaneously uh, just a little tip for you if you find yourself constantly in email conversations all day long uh, just set up an autoresponder and let them know that you're, you only check your emails twice a day. If you want to test it out, feel free to send me one. Send me an email and uh, just say I'm testing your autoresponder and you don't have to reply or something to that effect. And, and we'll know uh, exactly exactly why you're, test, why you're sending me an email. Uh, again, that's tersh at icebound.us. Not .com. I know it's crazy. It confuses a lot of people. Um, the guy that owns the .com domain wants $45,000 for it. So, uh, .us it is. <laughs> I'm sure you, there's several listeners out there who have uh, had the sa- a similar struggle. Well, I'd like to say thank you again to Adam for coming on to the uh, this episode of the Service Business Mastery Podcast. Don't forget to go to his website uh, to get more information about himself and the rest of uh, the CFO project. It's uh, www.thecfoproject.com forward slash SBM for service business mastery. And don't forget to leave us a review. We love those five star reviews. They really help us out uh, in the rankings organically. Uh, With that being said, I look forward to talking to you again next week on the service business mastery podcast the podcast for service business owners, managers, and technicians concerned becoming business owners themselves. Have a wonderful week.